speaker uh, on cross uh, border issues and the impact of cultural differences on cross border across the world i have got my colleague uh, steven rama who is the director and also head of business services at sanames for uh, brazil steven has today joined us from sao paulo welcome steven so welcome you know there is you know i think you know amongst our panelists um, uh, there is nobody more qualified than keith to talk about uh, cultural uh, differences and their impact keith has lived and worked in 10 different countries and i've got uh, steven who has um, you know now spent over 20 years in brazil and has acquired uh, the cultural fluency uh, if i may say so to uh, live and work in brazil and wider latin america market which is of uh, tremendous interest to many of uh, sanames folks um, clients so in the next 35 minutes uh, we are going to dedicate this to this topic um, and at the end of which uh, we are more than happy to take audience questions you can uh, on your screen you can see a chat window um, where you can log in your questions and i will um, uh, while i'm moderating it i will try and weave in your questions uh, to the panelists so cultural sensitization if i may say so has assumed tremendous significance in the past few years and this has been an ongoing conversation between me and keith because i do see him taking these fantastic sessions for uh, companies around the world as well as universities um, teaching the senior management to you know imbibe cultural sensitivity into the dna of the um, architecture of the uh, organization so and nowhere is this more visible uh, than a university or a college that is an active recruiter of international students um, around the world and um, today you know what i wanted to kind of start off this presentation with um, is that obviously it is a very important issue but at a generic level keep if you could tell us why do you think it is very important and if you could go on to the next slide that would be um, very helpful Okay, uh, thanks very much, Lakshmi. Um, it's a really interesting question. I think it would be good to look at this initially from a generic perspective, and then to drill down a little bit more detail on one or two of the specifics where it impacts on higher educational organisations. But I think it, when we thought about running this web webinar, we, we thought about the title quite carefully, and, and the title of the webinar is "Globalisation: It's a Mindset, Not a Word." and i think that's the basis of what i'd say why it's important for a generic perspective and um, if you market yourself as a global organization if you market yourself around the world as an organization who truly understands the modern world and the impact of the globalization and that you will be able to help your students to benefit from that process then i think you have to walk the walk there you can't just say you're a global organization you have to be it and you have to attack the mindset of every single person who works within your organization um, and it entails embedding this cultural awareness and knowledge and competence throughout the organization it's no longer just one or two people in an organization who work with people from other cultures it tends to be at all levels and in all functions and so this is a topic that becomes a whole organizational issue uh, and i think to move from globalization being a word to a mindset it's a very deliberate process it just doesn't happen by chance people are not innately born with the knowledge of how things are done differently around the world you need to help people to get that knowledge and once they've got that knowledge you have to help them to know how to apply it in their day-to-day -day inter interaction with people from different parts of the world and I think if you're selling yourself as a global organization, then this is a topic is not just a nice to do or a nice to know. It is absolutely a need to do. You have to do what you say you're going to do. And as well as working on this topic with a number of very large higher education organizations around the world, uh, I also work on this with some of the great uh, global commercial organizations and those organizations who are really serious in their global ambitions take this as a topic very seriously 
and they do a great deal of work with their employees and other stakeholders to build levels of competence, build levels of knowledge. And I think that great higher education institutions need to do that as well. So obviously uh, a massive topic, uh, and there are several strands to just this one theme. But you know, we have a limited period of time, yeah. and our audience of them have been uh, sitting there waiting patiently for us for uh, quite a fair bit of time. Oh, yeah. So I want us to kind of you know focus the attention on a few topics which you think are very important. So if we could move to the next slide, and I, I kind of you know request to take take us through some of the key themes yeah. in developing cultural. Absolutely, and, and I think you're right. Sir. One of the uh, the things I always feel when you look at the impact of cultural differences that what you're really looking at is how it is and why it is that people in different parts of the world may think differently and what the impact of that will be when they're going about their daily activities. And that is just an absolutely enormous topic. And it's very difficult to cover it in its entirety in a brief webinar like this. And so what I thought we could do is just look at a few specific issues which I think are critical for people to think about. And I'll only be able to cover these in a very uh, overview fashion. I'll be, I suppose, uh, touching the tip of an iceberg here. But the things I'd like to look at uh, on the screen there, I'd like to look at the imperative nature and the importance of relationship building in certain parts of the world and in certain countries. I want to look at the need for people to approach their own subconscious cultural biases. Um, I want to try and make a few points as we go through about how some of this stuff impacts on business development issues. I thought a very specific issue we could look at, something which is something quite uh, important and I, I get quite animated about, is the language that is very often used by academics when they're speaking to students who are not necessarily native speakers of English. Um, the issue around, do we actually deliver on the promises we make to our students before they come to us, wherever, whichever university we are? and then look very briefly at how an organization would go about starting the process of embedding uh, a global mindset within the weft and weave of the organization. So we'll, we'll cover those few issues. I'll say a few things about them. We'll, be, uh, we'll bring uh, uh, Stephen in from Brazil to make a few points from a Latin American perspective. And I know, Lakshmi, obviously you've got the Indian perspective as well. Yeah, so if you could kind of look at the next slide. I am quite intrigued to see that you know you have put relationship building right at the top of the heap, yeah. Yeah. So uh, if we could move to the next slide, that will be um, you know very helpful. So um, why have we put relationship building uh, at the top of the pile? Well, for me, uh, the single biggest difference that you find in approach to all kinds of working activities around the world would be that it, some cultures tend to put business before relationships whereas other cultures tend to put relationships before business. And what I mean by that, putting it very simplistically, is that if you put business before relationships, I will do business with you if your product's right, your price is right, and your delivery is right. But my personal relationship with you is very secondary to those harder issues. There are, however, other parts of the world where people will not do business with you, even if your product is right, your price is right, and delivery is right, until and unless they have decided that you are the type of people that they would be happy and comfortable to do business with in the long run. The relationship has to come first, only then might some business, some interaction flow. Now, if you look at that from a global perspective, the countries which tend to put business before relationships would be North America, the UK, certainly Northern Europe, Australia, uh, those cultures which put uh, relationships before business, who are they? Well, it's actually not that many people, actually. It's just the whole of Asia, the whole of the Middle East, the whole of Africa, South America, Central America, Southern America, and the vast majority of Central and Eastern Europe. And so those of us who are in the institutions in the West who are trying to develop relationships in the emerging markets, we are on the opposite side of that spectrum from most of the people we're trying to target. And I'm not sure that we understand A, that point, or B, the implications of that point. Okay, so you know, so you are saying that there is a clear cut divide between the source countries Absolutely. and the recipient countries. Absolutely. So at this point, I would like to bring you in, Stephen. Um, having 
spent such a long time uh, in uh, in Brazil and you know having experience doing business with the West, uh, being a Westerner sat in uh, Brazil. I what I wanted to hear from you um, is how how relevant or how big are relationships um, when somebody is trying to do wider Latin America? Well, uh, first of all, uh, thanks very much for inviting me to take part in this um, fascinating topic. It's something you know, which I think we've all lived with for many years. So it, there's no secret to it. We have to keep uh, keep thinking about it. I think um, from my experience, I would say that in this part of the world, uh, relationships are of greater importance than the business, if you like, as Keith mentioned. It's not universal. Um, and one has to think that it doesn't apply across the board, across a country or, or across all businesses. So it's complex. Uh, for instance, um, where I live, Sao Paulo, um, even Brazilians not, not to have to adapt to the uh, Sao Paulo way of doing business. And Sao Paulo businessmen have to adapt to the way of business in the interior, as we call it, of, of the country, in, in parts of the country which are like the other side of Europe, if you like, in terms of distance. In Sao Paulo, you know, generally it's more Western European, more United States. Of course, relationships are important, but they're not crucial. And people say it's easier to close a deal here, perhaps. Um, but if you go into to other parts of the, um, of the country, then you will find relationships are critical, depending obviously on the type of business you're in, but you have to spend more time on them. You have to build confidence. Uh, so, yes, but, um, and, you know, there's always things that's going to come along and trick you up uh, when you think you, you know it all. Um, just if I might add a couple of things to, to what Keith has said in more general terms. First of all, never forget that um, while you are trying to interpret a culture, that culture is trying to interpret you as well. And they may have, be having trouble working out what this Brit or this American or this Indian is actually thinking. So it has to work. You have to be self-conscious as well as conscious. And just the other one thing I'd add now uh, is that I don't think that it's stuck in time. You think, ah, now I understand how to do business in country X. Things change over time. Um, I, that's one of the benefits of, of working and, and living abroad for a while. You actually see changes. You know, the, the way people do business in Brazil is different from what it was 20 years ago. Um, I worked in the UK in the 1980s. And I worked again in, in, um, with the UK in the, in the last decade. And I noticed a significant way, a significant difference in the way people in the UK, for instance, operated than what I was used to when I actually worked there. And I'm British, you know, so, so things do change. And that's something I would say, you know, don't think you understand it. Uh, the ground can shift under your feet. OK, so. Definitely one thing that we have established is that, you know, it is a two way street. Uh, when you are judging someone, you are getting judged and the cultural, you know, differences are really going to make a difference in how you end up doing business together. So in your experience, Keith, what is the starting point for people to engage in and really take this topic um, very seriously? So if we could move to the next slide, um, you know, and if you could take us through what key um, areas are that we should be aware of. Yeah, well, I think that I'd just like to echo what Stephen just said uh, about um, this issue of uh, it being a two-way street. One of the problems that I quite often encounter uh, when we're, I'm talking to clients about the impact of cultural difference is that there is a tendency that when things go wrong, when you're working cross-border, that everybody points the finger and says it's all their fault. And it's never all their fault. It's always partly their fault and partly our fault. But I think what we're not very good at doing is understanding the impact that we are having on other people. Uh, and the, the way I like to explain this is that um, depending on where people are born and where they're raised, that the influences they go through are massively different. And that impacts on the way you think about things, the way in which you view the world. And I think that everybody as a result of those influences wears what I like to call a pair of cultural spectacles. And if you are American, the lenses in your spectacles were manufactured in, the, in, in America. And it, it kind of influences the way you view everything, the way you respond to everything. 
But of course, if you're American and dealing with a student from China or India, then those students are looking at you through a pair of spectacles, the lenses of which were made elsewhere. Uh, and they, their whole appraisal criteria around what constitutes a good professional approach from an academic or a support member of staff might be completely different than their use in their own country. And I think that simple fact accounts for the fact that quite often when you work in a, in a cross-border environment or with people from a different culture, you do something with them in a way that you know if you did it in your own culture, it would be very well received. And you do it the same way with those people and it seems to go quite badly. And you can't work out why that is, but it's generally speaking because you're being judged through a differing, and I think this is a crucial thing, a differing and very often unknown set of appraisal criteria. You have to accept when you work with people in other cultures that you probably don't see yourself as other people see you. Uh, and that's a really critical thing. And I, I'll tell you when it's a really critical thing. I think it's when you are trying to persuade and influence to do people to do things in a certain way. You can't really tell them. You want to persuade and influence them. In any persuading and influencing situation, 80% uh, of the battle is in the way you deliver your message. But if you don't know the best way to deliver your message to people from a certain culture, then it's likely that your message will be missed. And I think because of this subconscious bias that we all have, it's not a good thing, it's not a bad thing, it just is. Uh, because of this subconscious bias, I think that we all need to develop much higher levels of, of, uh, of objectivity. We need to be far less subjective and far more objective in our approach to people from other cultures. I suppose that what I'm saying there is you need the ability to take those spectacles off. And it is very easy for me to say to people, you need to take your cultural spectacles off. But in reality, that can be a very, very difficult to do because the programming that you have inside you is so hardwired. You might not recognize it, but it's there. Uh, and it works, as, as Stephen was just saying, it works both ways, but we're not always aware of that. So, you know, the, I find this whole point about language, you know, very interesting. Obviously, in India, we have 22 official languages. So we are so used to kind of, you know, trying to break down that barrier of language and um, culture because, you know, we are so diverse, 29 states, you know, several union territories. You know, it is part of our DNA to be able to navigate diversity quite well. We are we are okay in that. But I find that you know, in very homogeneous um, environment and people who grow up in that, they find it very hard to wrap their uh, head around uh, so much of diversity that you find in places like India. Yeah. So you know, on the point of um, language, Stephen, um, you know, with this uh, uh, with the government funding that has been put in place for Science Without Borders. A lot of Brazilian students are now leaving Brazil and going to study in different countries. Um, what are, you know, I would like to kind of, you know, hear your uh, comment on the English language ability of um, uh, Brazilian students and uh, what you also get in the wider uh, Latin American uh, region. I think it's fair to say that you know the reputation of uh, Brazilian students in English language skills is uh, middling now. It's it's not the top rank uh, for all sorts of reasons, um, including the teaching of English at schools and so on. Um, it's only now that people like real fluent skills in English are becoming more widespread. Of course, you know language is. It, one generalizes all the time. In any culture, you find amazingly competent linguists and people who just simply cannot cope with another language. And everybody normally fits in between those. Um, but I, it's, I think, from what I've seen and the, all the reporting on Science Without Frontiers, which of course isn't, isn't the first such program that um, Brazil has had, but it's certainly by far the largest. The, the English language skills are an issue. Um, and universities will always get um, get a very positive view if they take that into account and grasp that, embrace that issue, and provide the um, English language courses before the student starts the academic course. Um, the Brazilian government, for instance, is offering an online course just to, to people who've applied for uh, Science Without Frontiers scholarships and is doing its best to, to up their, their skills. 
but um, you know some countries have had to lower their expectations otherwise they weren't going to get many students because now we're talking about tens and tens of thousands not just the postgraduates but undergraduates for the first time in brazil brazil is sending large numbers of undergraduate students overseas so and there's still you know, language skills um are, are an issue study skills is another matter which we can talk about later um so the message is don't take things for granted and don't assume just because somebody's english isn't much good that uh, they're not any that they can't cope with the course um investment in early on in assessment and intensive english development is a must really for for many institutions thank you steve for that so in terms of the language you know aspect of things and cultural differences are there any generic points that you would like to raise well i think from a generic perspective whenever i run a workshop with a, a group of either business people or academics and i i ask them right at the front what they think is issues and difficulties are about working in a multicultural multilinguistic environment most people actually say it's communication and so it's a pretty obvious thing to say that when you're working in a, a very complex multicultural environment there are bound to be some communication issues uh, and i think that we, that's the starting point to recognize that they are going to be there and then the question is okay so what to do about them I think that the communication problems actually uh, stem from two areas. Yes, there's the, um, the the language competence issue, which Steve just touched on, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But I think there's a, another issue as well. It's not just that we all speak different languages, but it's very often to do with the fact that we use language differently. What one culture considers to be extremely good use of language, another uh, culture will see as completely poor use of language. And so the style of language is pretty important as well. You are able to alienate or befriend people simply through the style of language that you use. And again, I, I'm not sure that people are even aware of what style of language that they're using as opposed to what style of language somebody from another culture might be using. But on the pure linguistic side of things, I think it's interesting, and I agree with Stephen saying that you need to look at uh, appraisal of student levels, you need to look at intensive student uh, development, but I think you also need to look at the academic side of this. What type of language are your academics using to a multicultural, multilinguistic audience in, in a lecture theatre? Um, I was... Um, uh, I attended a lecture in one of the British universities that I've been doing some work with recently. I sat in there and it was a British lecturer and he was talking to a very uh, multicultural audience. And at one point, he was talking about something, at one point he said, and of course, if you did that, or if you could do that, it would be like pulling a white rabbit out of a hat. Now that is a reference to Lewis Carroll in Alice in Wonderland. And I just wonder how many of the Chinese students in the audience at that point would understand that illusion. So are we actually making the academics look at the type of language that they use? I always say that I speak a number of languages, the most useful one of which is English is a foreign language. And when I'm speaking to a multicultural audience, I don't speak in the same way as I do if I'm speaking to a group of Brits or Americans. I'm very carefully choosing the language that I use, the structures that I use. I'm avoiding using colloquialisms. Um, and that's an active issue it's almost like speaking a foreign language uh, and as i said I speak three languages but that's the most useful one I, uh, I can speak because i can use that everywhere in the world so looking at those that our academics use is it user friendly for the people they have in their lecture theater or their or their classes it is absolutely critical i think and and i'm not aware of you know i don't think to a large extent that people look at that so um I think if we don't address that point, as I, I put in there, again, it's a question of if we don't address the language that our academics are using, can we truly say that we're delivering on our promise to our students? If they're being spoken to in a way that many of them don't understand all of it, or maybe sometimes don't understand a great deal of it. So that sets the stage very nicely for the next slide, which is uh, about delivering on the promise that we make to students. Um, you know, it is it is quite quite interesting because we now see more and more universities and colleges becoming active recruiters in different parts of the world. So parents are 
putting all of their uh, you know savings um, towards educating their one child uh, uh, you know who wants to go and study abroad yeah so what are the problem areas that you can see uh, in this if we fail to deliver on that promise that we are making to a student yeah well i mean i've put at the top there communication effectively and i'm not going to cover that again but i think that is definitely a starting point you know, are we delivering what we're delivering in a way that people can understand? And that would seem to me to be a baseline and something that all organisations really have to look at very, very closely and kind of audit, really. Um, but then I think another thing that I see, and again, another example I can use, uh, uh, British University I was doing some work with, that I was uh, just having a walk around, looking at some lectures, looking at some classes. And they're selling a global product where students will come from around the world work in a, a multicultural global environment and they will benefit from those different influences that they interact with on a daily basis and that's part of their key sales message so i walk into a classroom and the classroom is divided into two and at one end of the classroom it's full of chinese students in a group and at the other end of the classroom it's full of english students in a group and there's no cross-border integration there. The lecturer, the, the, the teacher is there seemingly very happy that that's happening. But I question, is that delivering what we're actually saying? So how, what are we doing? What processes are we putting in place to ensure that what actually happens in the lecture theatre or the classrooms matches our sales message when we're selling to our, to our students? Um, and the other issue I put on there, which I think probably universities are a lot better at would be this issue around there is no consistent view on what is good or bad style of education. Different uh, cultures have different approaches to how they think teachers should teach, how they think students should learn. Some of it, as we know, is much more instructional, much more rote learning than you might want to uh, deliver in the West. And so what I'm not saying here is that you should change your teaching style. But what I do think is that if you're accepting students from a culture where your teaching style will be alien to all of their experiences, then the least we can do is to teach them how we're going to teach them. They have to know what to expect from what we're going to deliver to them. Otherwise, you, you, just, um, you just leave them be, uh, bewildered, really, I think. Um, and, and I think that you shouldn't just do that in the classroom and the lecture room i think you also have to do it throughout all of the support services of the university student accommodation the interaction of the cleaners people who work in the canteens people who work in the cafes they also need to understand what the expectations of their clients are and how they can adapt effectively to meet those expectations Stephen, i wanted to bring you in uh, into this conversation because you know with more and more Brazilian students, for example, leaving Brazil and um, going and pursuing opportunities uh, elsewhere. Uh, what do you think are the expectations that Brazilian students have, for example, you know, when they choose to leave for a one year, uh, you know, immersion somewhere else? Um, really keen to know what you think. Okay. Um, well, I think they, they expect to get uh, a mixture of good education, you know, they, they get very excited about being exposed to a different educational environment, to different nationalities. Still, Brazil, you know, things are changing rapidly, but still a lot of young Brazilians don't have the exposure to different nationalities that, that you are more used to. Uh, so they're excited about all that mix. They, they uh, look forward to an overall cultural experience. They expect to travel. You know, they're expecting not to spend the whole time studying. Yes, they're going to study. They know that's what they're there for, but not purely that. And uh, they want to, they will use wherever they are the base for traveling more broadly to understand the culture. So it's, I think any student will expect a mixture of a learning experience in the more academic sense and a learning experience in the cultural ex uh, to a cultural extent as well and that needs to be addressed and needs to be considered when you're looking at the programming so university which is, for instance which is offering a wide range of activities of um, sporting cultural activities outside the academic program will always do well i feel with them um 
in terms of the learning experience, perhaps I could add something to, to this point about um, different approaches to study. Um, in case people think, oh, it's a bit theoretical, well, it isn't at all. It can affect the, the universities quite dramatically. For many years, the Brazilian um, education ministry, the science sector, which actually handed out, um, funded Brazilian government scholarships to study abroad for masters and doctorates, had a buy Britain last policy. And I'll mention this because of the trouble that Brazilian students had in actually adapting to the very, if I'm, at the time, I'm, I'm looking back, this is not about the present, it was some many, couple of decades ago, when, they were, when the policy was, say, for a PhD student or a master's student, get on with it yourself, come and see me every so often by the supervisor. And that didn't cut it. They thought, well, I'm here, I need guidance. I've got all these cultural issues. These uh, I, need. I haven't read perhaps the range of material that um, uh, a, native speak, a native student might have read, so I need to catch up on things, need more guidance. And because it got so bad, you know, the Brazilian government actually cut back on the number of scholarships it would support in, in a number of subjects in that particular country because of it. So it actually is a very of direct relevance that and uh, any institution that needs to look quite hard at the perception of the way it is approaching study um, and helping students learn. OK, thank you for that, Steve. Keith, this has been really interesting. And, you know, that sets us up for the next slide where, you know, what I want you to kind of tell the audience is the top five things that you would kind of uh, suggest to institutions that want to embed, you know, cultural sensitization into the architecture of the institution. Okay. I mean, I'm, the first thing that I'm going to say may sound like a, uh, an obvious thing to say, but I think it is absolutely critical. And that is that you need to start at the top. You need to get the senior leadership of any organisation to buy into the fact that this issue of the impact of cultural difference is something that can have a very significant impact on the development of their organisation over a period of time. It's not just something that's quite interesting. It's something that is of very direct relevance. And people say to me, you know, what areas is it of relevance to? And I think that's the wrong question because then the answer should be, are there any areas of your organization that this is not relevant to? And I think the answer is no, it isn't. But you have to get the leadership at the top to buy into that as an issue. Because unless you get the leadership at the top to buy into it, then you don't get the cascade. You need to get that senior management buy-in uh, and you need to have sponsors who are going to push things through the organization. So, Whenever I start working with the university and people ask me that question, I say, well, I want to spend a day with your senior leadership team and I want to challenge them and I want to challenge their assumptions and I want to challenge what they're saying in the marketplace about how they're actually delivering against that. And then once you've done that and you get by in the senior leadership, then it's a question of cascading the learning and the knowledge across the organisation. And it's a strange thing because cultural awareness, uh, whatever you turn you want to use, is often referred to as a soft skill uh, and in a way it is but i think it's diamond hard because it goes right to the heart of how effectively and efficient you can run your organization and if it's viewed as a soft skill it's a strange soft skill because it's very much information based so the process has got to be you need to get people to buy in to this as an issue at an intellectual level then you need to give them some knowledge so people can't just work out what the cultural expectations of Chinese students are. It's a knowledge-based issue. And then when you've got the awareness and the knowledge, then you have to look at, okay, so how does that impact on the day-to-day -day activities that we're engaged in? And what do we need to start action pointing, changing or, or whatever? And one very, um, very important thing for me is to not focus on the superficial elements of cultural difference. There is a school of thought, I think, that would say, Cultural difference is all about things like you should never do that to an Arab in the Middle East because that's an insult. And that's quite interesting and it's true, but for me that is absolutely the superficiality of the impact of cultural difference can have. What you should be looking at is what's happening here, what's the mindset that I with my cultural background and take into this situation, how might that differ from the mindset of an Indian student that I'm engaged with? And what are the impacts of those differences? So it's looking at these things 
at a much deeper level. And my final piece of advice would be start now. Uh, the global education race is running. Uh, the competition is getting safer. Students are getting more selective in uh, choosing their universities. And those universities who really get to understand this, who drive this global mindset through the weft and the weave of their organisations, are the ones which will move up the rankings and do well. And the ones that don't are the ones that will fall by the wayside. And I really believe this is absolutely central and core to delivering against your message. Okay. Thank you for that. We do have um, some questions uh, from the audience. So one interesting question that has um, come up is that with the development of, you know, and the spread of internet uh, and global travel, um, cultural differences are likely to disappear. Do you agree? Um, I, think it's a, I think it's a really interesting question. Uh, it's a question I get asked a lot. Um, will, as we travel all around the world, will all these cultural differences disappear? Will we all we just become some kind of global salad where we're all very similar? And I've asked that question a lot, uh, and I've thought about it a great deal, and I've got a very profound answer, which is that I don't know. Um, and I don't think anybody else does either. It's, if you think about it, it's a reasonably recent phenomenon in the history of mankind. This, So I think the jury is still out on that. And I do recognise there's a push for that homogenisation. But the other thing that I find fascinating when I look around the world is another geo-economic political trend that I see is independence movements. It's the Basque region, it's Scotland for goodness sake, saying, no, we've got our own culture, we're going to fight almost to the death to defend that. And those two seem to be pulling in different directions. Which of them will win in the end, only time will tell. You could say, will the Chinese move from a relationship-based approach to a business before a relationship-based approach? And, well, they might do. They might well do. I don't know. But what I do know is there's 1.3 billion of them. And if that happens, it's not going to happen by next Tuesday. It's going to take a much longer time than that. And these changes, as Stephen was talking about, do occur, but they change over time, and it's very difficult to assess which way it's going to change, you know, looking forward, I think, it depends on some factors. Okay. Um, you know, we have got, you know, questions coming thick and fast. I'm going to pick up another one, which is, um, you know, international students um, come to universities uh, to ad adapt themselves to the new way of life. So they go to American institutions to be more American uh, or they approach British universities to you know, understand the British way of life. So then why should these universities adapt? You know, why should they bother to deal with the anxieties and you know, the cares of an Indian student or, uh, or someone who has come all the way from Nigeria? Why should they worry? Well, I think there's a number of a number of reasons. First of all, is that that adaptation is a process. It doesn't happen from one day to another. It would be unrealistic to expect anybody to acclimatise in a short space of time. And so, through that acclimatisation process, the more support you can give them, the more likely they are to last the course, be successful students, go back, give your organisation a good press back in their home country. That that would be one reason. I think another reason is that. We are not saying to the students who come from Nigeria that you have to be British. We're just saying you have to understand the British approach. They're still Nigerian. But how are they going to do that unless we help them to do that? Again, it's not going to happen by osmosis, so it has to be a process of acclimatisation. And the third thing is that it is very much in our interests to be able to understand what the uh, anxieties of people are when they arrive so that we can build our processes to approach those because we all know the stats on students who don't stay the course at universities and students for that purpose these students and the fact that they just can't find themselves so it's, it, it's good for the people but it's good for business as well okay there's a question that has come for you steve um you know in the last 48 hours dilma has won the elections and um should institutions be ready for the floodgates to be open with another 100,000 Brazilian students due to arrive in the next you know, couple of years. So, you know, somebody wants to know the answer to that. Yeah, 
Fair enough. Again, I'll do a, a Keith and say, well, I don't know. But uh, the, I'll look into my crystal ball. The, both, uh, both candidates confirmed their support for Science Without Frontiers program. So it will continue. I think there's, unless something dramatic happens, it will not be discontinued. Um, the issues are more about funding than anything else. Uh, what's emerging, if you like, is that there's going to have to be some sort of fiscal shock in, in Brazil um, if it's to succeed in the global economy um, and move ahead over the next few years. And um, this irreversible increase in taxation and government funding, something's got to break in that. It cannot go on forever. Um, PT's, the Dilma's got another another four years. Um, she hasn't appointed her who's going to take over from Mantega as the um, the uh, Minister of the Econ Economy. But the word is that there will be a financial package in the new year uh, and there will be cuts in government spending in certain areas. On the, on the other side, of course, is education, you know, it, top area for investment. Um, my feeling is, you know, I don't have the answer. Yes, the program will continue, but um, it's not going to be a particularly easy ride. Um, I'll share with you one, um, I don't know, perhaps rumor, um, I might call it, um, coming from some sources that I, I've spoken to in Brasilia, that um, if they do cut back on funding, they'll try and keep the numbers up, but find a way of cutting back the financial impact of each scholarship. And the people who are going to have to look to that are the universities and their fee income rather than the students and their not particularly generous um, cost of living allowances. So um, be prepared to, to defend your your um, fees, I feel, is probably the message I give. OK, thank you for that. We have a very interesting question that has come up. Um, someone is asking us. How do staff and admin engage faculty in incorporating cross-cultural and linguistic sensitivities into teaching styles? And what would motivate faculty to change, especially when you know underlying this change could be their feeling that you know their this the quality of the education that they are delivering is being eroded by them having to change? Yeah, that's a really good question, I think. And it's interesting because I've just been working uh, with a British university on this very question. Uh, and um, I think this is where, when you talk about it getting into the real weft and the weave of an organization, this is how deep it has to go. So this organization is making it part of the appraisal criteria for faculty. There, ha there are certain things that they have to do in terms of the way they run their classrooms. There are certain things they have to do in terms of the way in which they use language. And they're going to be appraised on that. And that will be directly linked to their remuneration. So uh, the, the organization has taken the view that we are a global organization. This is what we're striving for. This is what we're driving for. And everybody has to buy into that. It's not an opt-in or opt-out process. You opt-in, or I suppose you opt out completely. Um, and so they are just starting this year this whole new appraisal criteria where internationalization and mindset is right at the fore of it. And I think that's the depth you have to try and go to if you're really going to make a significant impact on people. Well, I mean, that does tell me that that change has been driven in that particular university right from the top. Yes, absolutely. Uh, because, you know, like you said, it is not an opt in and opt out process. You know, and if the senior management believes that you know internationalization and cultural sensitization are two major things that they want to pursue, then every single staff member from yeah. top to so bottom needs to believe in it. Each faculty has to develop a globalization plan. Each uh, uh, service stream, whether it be facilities, whether it be finance, whatever. They also have to develop a globalization plan with measurables, which will be appraised by senior leaders. And each of the heads of those faculties or service lines is responsible for delivering against the plan that they put together. And that's the depth to which they're doing it. It's a five-year plan. Yeah. 
Okay, so this is a British university it's that British you university, yes. that you were because we just have another question from someone saying, you know, which country is this university in? And it is a British university yeah. that keeps us uh, working with uh, currently. Yeah. So uh, that brings us to a, a, a nice close uh, to this discussion, uh, which I thought, uh, you know, was very uh, because as I'm someone who travels around the world meeting universities, and uh, you know increasingly more and more universities and colleges are wanting to recruit students from around the world and uh, this is no longer something that you can bury your head in the sand and say that you know, it will go away it is not going to go away, no, it's right? not going to go away. as uh, the the source markets become richer more and more students from middle class and even lower strata of society will be wanting to leave the country they might not be the most culturally fluent so you need to have process as recipient institutions to make sure that they integrate yeah. into into the uh, wider organization absolutely yeah absolutely. so uh, thank you very much for that uh, both of you it's been really valuable and thank you to all of our um, attendees today apologies once again for um, our uh, technical glitches right at the start um, and thank you for uh, you know staying on to uh, listen to uh, this very interesting discussion. Uh, I do hope that as our audience you have enjoyed the discussion that has happened uh, today. Um, and uh, thank you for tuning in. And if you want to raise any further uh, questions or queries, uh, Keith will be more than happy to kind of you know um, give his uh, perspectives. Uh, he's forever yeah, I'm, wanting I'm, to listen. I'm to very me. aware that in a webinar like this, I can only scratch the surface, and there's huge levels of depth to each of the points that we've made here. So if anybody wants to pick up any of the spe specifics or general thinking, very happy to have a conversation. Great. So uh, that is it from all of us here across uh, three different uh, geographies. Thank you for uh, thank you to our team uh, sat back in India for having pulled this together and thank you to Steve who has logged in uh, from Sao Paulo um, and it is uh, goodbye from all of us here till next time see you soon bye bye, bye.